So welcome everybody to uh, this year's uh, American Finance Association lecture, 2023. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, my friend and a former colleague, Oleg Itzotsky, for to give this presidential address. Uh, Oleg is uh, this year's uh, John Bates Clark medal winner. So he's uh, the top economist under the age of 40. Uh, just uh, got this prize uh, recently. He is working and is one of the leading experts on international macroeconomics, on exchange rates, international finance, uh, and you know he's the voice to listen to. Uh, he got a, a Sloan Fellowship. He got many prizes. Was on the Revier tour and so forth. Originally, uh, Oleg came, is out of Russia. He studied uh, his undergraduate studies in the New School of Economics in Moscow. Then he went to Harvard, did his PhD there and then came to Princeton and we became uh, colleagues uh, for 11 years. And I hope this were his forming years uh, at Princeton. And, um, and then he moved in 2016, he moved to UCLA and um, is um, shaping the field uh, from UCLA. He's also very engaged in PhD students. I see several of his PhD students uh, in the audience. Uh, so he's uh, really uh, also working on the next generation. And Oleg is, uh, is, is fun to hang out with, uh, you will see. Um, he has always a positive attitude uh, to all, uh, to his surroundings. So it's, uh, it's always nice to be uh, close to him. He's also, he became a dedicated biker and I was told he's now surfing also being in, in Los Angeles. Uh, but today we will talk about work and that's, uh, we will focus on today. So today we'll talk about the exchange rate puzzles and policies. And Oleg, the floor is yours. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thanks. Thanks very much, Marcus, for the introduction. Um, yeah, I was going to say, um, I, I didn't realize that econ and finance are in different hotels. So I had to run from a session uh, in, at Hilton. And so I had this uh, delightful memories of the job market of running between the hotels, which is you know no longer here, but in my times that, that's how we did it. <laughs> so um, I want it, it's it's a high bar, I guess, to keep people uh, entertained here. It's it's a macro paper in a finance association. Uh, so what I'll try to do is I'm going to try to talk about so recent development in international macro and finance. They have very clear overlaps with finance topics, with macro finance topics, but nonetheless, uh, the work that we've done so far, it will be largely an overview of the work that I did with uh, Dima Muchen, who is here in the audience. Uh, it's really international macro work, but uh, it relies very heavily on themes from international finance, and so I'm, I'm going to try to emphasize uh, the interaction between the, the macro and finance here. And so th this is the set of papers that we started working on them a while back, uh, but this is uh, kind of the recent drafts of, uh, of these papers. And so I will try to emphasize kind of how one paper led to the next one. And sort of like we started with basic thinking about exchange rates. How can we write down a model, a macroeconomic model of exchange rate, which is not failing, in, uh, you know, uh, which is not uh, failing miserably badly when it's confronted with the data, right? So we didn't set a very high bar in the beginning. And as we kept working on it, it's sort of like it's kind of, we had to peel the onion and new, new themes arise. And then eventually, like the current project is the project about exchange rate policies. Um, throughout this research agenda, finance plays a very important role, but we kind of have not really went into finance topics yet, but I'll show you the entry points. Um, yeah, so, you know, exchange rate just proved to be one of the most pervasively puzzling variables for uh, macroeconomic models, I guess for finance models as well to a large extent. And kind of the situation here is that as soon as you write down a model with more than one country, whether you want it or not, exchange rate is there. You can write down a model where exchange rate is trivially equalized to one all the time, but it's still there. And this model still gives a counterfactual prediction for exchange rate then. So ignoring exchange rate is, you can ignore that exchange rate is a variable in the data and not look at its empirical properties. That's a possibility. But once you write down a model with more than one country, you cannot really ignore exchange rate as a theoretical object. It's, it's, it's right there. Furthermore, it turns out that um, 
a lot of the policies in the open economy, right? If you do closed economy analysis, obviously you don't care about the exchange rate. But as soon as you want to do optimal policy design in open economies, exchange rate is kind of a key object, right? And we oftentimes talk about why, whether countries should float the exchange rate or should they adopt a pact, be part of a currency union, what are the costs of being part of the currency union? And so you kind of really need a model of exchange rate to you know, even begin to think about those questions. And if you don't really trust your model of exchange rate, its macroeconomic properties, then it's very difficult to know whether you should trust the policy implications of such models as well, right? Especially like how much uh, should we trust, you know, our conclusions about the costs and benefits of Eurozone if we don't really have a model that's consistent with a bunch of properties of exchange rates under the float, right? And so this is kind of the starting point. Um, and, uh, you know, most of the literature, th this, th this are long-standing puzzles in the literature, and there is a large literature trying to address one puzzle at a time. So our approach with Demo is really to try to think about these puzzles as a combined description of the data generating process for exchange rates. So you don't want to ignore any dimension of the behavior of exchange rate, right? You don't want to focus on co-movement with consumption and ignore the co-movement with interest rates, right? And um, sort of what we try to do is write down a uh, framework that can simultaneously to talk to a lot of, well, in fact, all of these puzzles at once. And then we didn't know when we started, but as we kept working on it, it offers a very nice policy analysis framework, right? And so that th these are kind of the steps that I will try to go through uh, in this lecture. Yeah, so here I tried to list the set of empirical properties that I'm gonna call facts about exchange rates, but most of them have some puzzle name to it, right? Like, so for example, the first fact is called exchange rate disconnect puzzle. Uh, a narrow version of it is oftentimes referred to as a Mizan Rogoff puzzle. Uh, and the idea is, well, exchange rate is a random walk. That property is not so difficult to generate in models. If shocks are persistent, you get processes for a lot of variables that are close to random walks. So getting a random walk in exchange rate is not that hard. But a much more pervasive and difficult puzzle to address is even if you knew information from the future, if you knew macro variables tomorrow, if you knew what happened to monetary policy, to interest rates, to output, output gap, inflation, uh, consumption, this doesn't really help you predict what happens to exchange rates from today to tomorrow. And that's a very surprising property, right? You're trying to improve a forecast of exchange rate over random walk. Even if I give you information from the future, it's quite difficult to improve that forecast over a random walk forecast. And that's really uh, the core of the mise en rogue for the disconnect puzzle, right? And so you want to write down a model where correlations between exchange rates and macro variables are very weak, close to zero, while a lot of the models predict, in fact, strong correlations between macro variables and different notions of exchange rate. Furthermore, exchange rate is about an order of magnitude more volatile than macro variables. So typical standard deviations of you know, inflation, uh, consumption, output is about 1% to 2% a year. Uh, float in exchange rates, um, standard deviation is 10 12% a year. And so the question is, why do you have this disconnect in volatilities as well, right? So the finance version of that is, in fact, the statement that exchange rates are too smooth, right? They're too smooth relative to the stock market. They're about two thirds as volatile as the stock market. Uh, and so this is an important puzzle to address. I'm not gonna talk about it today. This is part of the research agenda too. I mean, uh, we kind of have uh, a sense of the explanations there, how to write down a macro model that's simultaneously consistent with you know, smoothness of exchange rate relative to the stock market. But I, I, I'm not gonna cover it uh, in the slides at least today. The next puzzle, and in fact, one of the famous ones, the ones from which this whole research agenda started many, many years ago, you know, people have been working on this for decades, you know, going back probably 50 years, uh, is the PPP puzzle. And it's the fact that you can look at a nominal exchange rate, which is a relative price of currencies, and you can look at the real exchange rate, which is a relative price of goods, of consumption baskets. Real exchange rate is also a deviation from the purchasing power parity, right? So it's a very kind of real object. And exchange rate is a very monetary object. It's about the relative price of currencies, right? But for some reason, for, mo for rich countries that control inflation, uh, nominal and real exchange rates are nearly perfectly correlated. It's sort of not that surprising if you thought prices were very sticky, but the problem is that that near perfect co-movement uh, persist to horizons way past beyond any degree of price stickiness to five years out and even longer. And so whenever you try to kind of see uh, is the 
uh, you know, real exchange rate may be mean reverting and nominal exchange rate is not. Does the gap open between the two? Well, the answer is in finite samples that we have, you, you don't have really much evidence that the two, you know, decouple very much, right? They just happen to be highly correlated even at horizons above uh, five years. Uh, the next puzzle, and this is the one that really links finance and international macro, it's kind of probably a core puzzle in both, is uh, Beku Smith's puzzle. So uh, um, uh, Robert Coleman and Beku Smith kind of documented in the data that if you look at movement between real exchange rate and relative consumption, the correlation is negative. Well, if you think about perfect um, risk sharing, it predicts a positive perfect correlation of plus one. So the data is close to zero, slightly negative. A lot of models predict plus one, right? And so the question is, how do you explain that? And it turns out, in particular in international macro, it turns out to be a very challenging model that even giving up on complete markets does not really help you solve it. And I'm gonna kind of talk about it a lot, but a little later, I need to build up to get there. Uh, again, another puzzle that comes from finance is the forward premium or UIP puzzle, uh, you know, the famous Fama 1980 paper, huge literature both in finance and uh, international macro. Uh, oftentimes the emphasis is that there is a wrong correlation uh, between interest rate differentials and uh, fo forward looking appreciations, right? Like that basically from a point of view of some sort of equalization of expected returns, high interest rate must mean that you expect a devaluation of that currency to compensate for the high interest rate. Otherwise, there is a, a profit opportunity that opens up the, the basis for carry trades, right? Uh, so a lot of emphasis in the literature was on the sign of the coefficient. We kind of think that that emphasis is somewhat misplaced. The coefficient is close to zero. The, the emphasis should really be that R squared and that reg regression is about zero, right? It's It's kind of 0.01 R squared. And so <clears throat> it turns out it's not very difficult for models to match that R squared. It's just not, uh, in the class of models that we'll be working with, it's just not a very powerful moment for identification, it turns out. Uh, but it's also an important feature of the data that carry trade returns are there, but not very high in terms of the sharp ratio. And the R squared and the FAMA regression is close to zero. This would be our and you know, if you want, the coefficient is negative as well, but it's not as important in our opinion. And finally, there is a Musa puzzle. And it turns out that these puzzles, they kind of crucially, uh, crucial statistical discipline and devices for macro model of exchange rates under the float. But as I will show you, it basically does not give you an entryway into thinking about policies, right? But the Musa puzzle turns out to be a crucial additional feature of the data that allows us to get into the policy analysis, right? And so what is the Musa puzzle? Essentially, you can think of, let's look at all the statistical properties under the floating exchange rate regime, and let's look at the statistical properties under the fixed exchange rate regime, the way they change. And it turns out they change in a very peculiar way. I'm gonna talk about it in a couple of slides. And this provides a very sharp identifying tool for us for thinking about the right financial model of exchange rate. And knowing that allows us to go to policy. Right, and so hopefully it will, at, at this point, it's not supposed to be clear, right, at all. <laughs> but hopefully it will become clear in a few slides. Um, okay, so let me show you a couple of things in pictures, how I think about exchange rate disconnect in pictures. So this is like a conventional picture. This is GDP per capita, PPP adjusted for a bunch of countries. So the rich countries here are Switzerland, United States, uh, UK, Japan, Australia, these are the rich countries that I plot. And you kind of can see this orderly progress, right? Like you see this, you know, fairly smooth developments, kind of constant, fairly constant growth rates, right? Nothing crazy in this picture. But what will happen if we plot this picture in dollars, right? Not in current dollars, not PPP adjusted, but in current dollars. And so I, I, I plot here Switzerland, uh, US and Australia. And so you see that back in 2000, uh, Switzerland was as typical Swiss citizen was as rich as typical American citizen according to this measure. You don't want to do comparisons over time because there is inflation over time. But in a given point in time, it gives you a ranking of countries. So basically, if you say, let's take a typical Swiss person and a typical American and put them in a duty-free shop in Frankfurt, the purchasing power of a typical Swiss person and a typical American person was about the same in 2000. Let's scroll forward 15 years and suddenly a typical Swiss person is two times richer than a typical American person, right? And so the question is, how can you, you know, think of a macro model 
in which relative purchasing ability of a Swiss person relative to an American person can increase two times over a period of 10 years. And then you look at the domestic macro aggregates and nothing happened to them. You know, normal GDP growth, normal inflation, nothing abnormal. But this humongous swing in the purchasing ability of a typical Swiss person, a typical American, if you put them in a duty-free shop in the same place. Obviously, they don't, this is not where they buy their consumption baskets, right? But nonetheless, you can do that, you know, uh, thought exercise, right? Same thing with Australia. It was half as rich in 2000 and suddenly become 60% richer than America uh, 10 years later. Of course, you can tell me that, you know, Switzerland was a, a boom of demand for safe assets that were produced by Switzerland, and Australia was a commodity boom, and both of it is true. But nonetheless, you still want to write down a model where this picture could be, you know, an outcome without any kind of crazy movements in the domestic macro aggregates, right? Like a well-being of a, a typical Swiss person if we measure it in income per capita adjusted for cost of living, right, did not increase as dramatically as this picture would suggest. Well, this picture, you know, UK gives us a lot of interesting data to think about because it's a floating exchange rate and lots of shocks, right? So this is, in the end of the sample there, it's a Brexit shock. On the day when the Brexit vote was announced, the pound moved 11%. And of course, it's a forward-looking variable, so it anticipated a lot of things that might happen. So it's not surprising that the pound moved by 11%. But if you look at any macro variable, there is no discontinuity before the vote and after the vote. So the amazing thing here is not the jump on the exchange rate, it's a forward-looking variable, but like when exchange rate jumps, why the rest of the macro economy not responding to that? You know, next month, three months later, six months later, they, you would not be able to detect any sort of structural break in the macro series. And so this is another notion of the disconnect here going from a jump on exchange rate, which is easy to understand, to the lack of any movement in macro variables, right? Uh, so this is the recent UK event when the pound again moved by around 10%. At first it depreciated and then it appreciated. So this one is in a way less surprising because it was not a persistent movement in the exchange rate. The Brexit one was a persistent movement. But this one is interesting. Our model will be able to kind of, I mean, I'm building up to saying that I have a model that kind of can talk to a lot of these pictures. And this picture would be an interesting one for thinking about policies. Uh, this is Abenomics in Japan. Uh, so Shinzo Abe, when he became the prime minister, he announced Abenomics. It had a number of uh, policy components to it. One of them was QE, and QE was very successful at depreciating the yen. So the yen depreciated about two times, but nothing happened to the rest of the macro. There was no inflation, there was no change in output growth. And so you can write down models where nothing moves, right? These are the models of liquidity traps when you know, your uh, monetary easing just doesn't help to anything. But in those models, exchange rate will not be moving as well, right? And so here you need sort of a model where the policy was successful at moving exchange rate, but not successful at, uh, you know, uh, doing anything to inflation or to the output gap, right? And it's a challenge. If you try to do it with a macro model, you're just not going to be able to calibrate it that way. Uh, you know, conventional macro model, I should say. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'm going to have time to talk about this, but this is what happened to the ruble after sanctions, after the war in Ukraine started and uh, uh, sanctions were imposed on the Russian economy. And so the amazing thing is the same framework that we're going to write down for thinking about very financial kind of questions. We'll kind of also talk to this path of the ruble exchange rate. So we can basically use the same equations and plug in sanctions in those equations instead of financial shocks and it will uh, spit out something that looks like the pass of the ruble exchange rate in 2022. Okay, so this was kind of the motivating facts, kind of the set. You can characterize them as unconditional moments that I showed you on the first slide and like bullet points, but then the pictures were meant to illustrate how those facts manifest themselves, right? In uh, particular episodes of time, right? So from now, it's really the analysis, right? So this picture is a little more information about exchange rates. So what I plot here is different notions of nominal and real exchange rates and terms of trade. And so if you look at, well, there is, it's a U.S trade-weighted, I think, nominal exchange rate against its main trade partners. And then I plot a bunch of uh, comparable real exchange rates against the same trade partners. So it could be a consumer-based real exchange rate, which says if I looked at the price of a consumption basket in US relative to a price of consumption basket in other countries, how does that relative price evolves? 
and this is, I think, a blue line. Black is nominal, blue is consumer-based real exchange rate. Red is, let me look at producers. What is the producer-based, producer price-based real exchange rate? And again, it moves together. Then we can look at wages and we can say, well, let's look at typical incomes that people get as workers and let's look at a wage-based real exchange rate, right? Like, uh, uh, you know, a unit wage in US relative to a unit wage in those other countries. And amazingly, even the wage-based thing uh, at high frequency moves. Obviously, the gaps opens up more persistently between the wage-based and price-based because all the accumulated labor productivity differences should be in that gap. So it's not surprising. But what's surprising that at high frequency, all those notions of real exchange rate move. And then you have this... Uh, loan relative of these variables is the terms of trade, right? So terms of trade is green, and it's just not doing the same thing as the exchange rates, right? So in a lot of our models, we're going to confuse real exchange rate with terms of trade because models say they should be very closely correlated and can move very closely. But in the data, terms of trade is this well-behaved, macro, stable variable moving a little bit, slightly positively correlated with exchange rate, but nothing like the craziness that we observe uh, in the exchange rate. And obviously, this is also part of the moments that you, you want to capture in the model. OK, so finally, I can get to the Musa puzzle. So Musa puzzle is this uh, thought exercise that I'm going to do uh, in these four subplots. So the first plot is the real exchange rate. Uh, 73 was the year, you know, February 73 is when Bretton Woods system collapsed. U.S. refused to exchange dollars for pounds, of dollars for gold, and uh, basically the big countries went into a float against the dollar. Before 73, it was a nearly perfect peg. The last couple of years were associated with some jump appreciations and devaluations of certain currencies, but these were like isolated events. Other, other, outside of those isolated events, this was a perfect peg of all G7 countries to the dollar, basically. So in nominal, if I plotted you the nominal exchange rate, it was completely flat before 73, and then became a volatile variable after 73. What's interesting here in the top panel, I'm plotting the real exchange rate. I mean, it's not so surprising that nominal exchange rate changes its property when you change a monetary regime. But why should the real exchange rate change its property? And in fact, what happened is that real exchange rate looked like a normal macro variable. So I plot it on a scale of you know, the same scale. So in the bottom, it's the consumption. I could have plot output or inflation. And so real exchange rate behaved sort of like a normal macro variable during the peg with a standard deviation annualized about 2% a year. But suddenly you go to a different monetary regime and uh, real exchange rate starts looking like nominal exchange rate under the float with an annual standard deviation of 12%. Right, and there is a clear discontinuity. You, 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 you look at the data, you immediately see, oh, and by the way, this is just raw data. I didn't do any transformation of the data. It's really just the evolution of the dollar trade weighted exchange rate against a bunch of rich countries. And you kind of see immediately where the structural break happened. You look at consumption or you could look at inflation or you can look at you know, output. You cannot eyeball any kind of structural break. And even if you use statistical methods, if they will find a structural break anywhere, you know, changes in the properties of consumption were maybe by 5, 10, 15%. Change in the behavior of exchange rate was 10 times. So it's an order of magnitude difference, right? And so this is the basis for the uh, Musa puzzle. So Musa famously said, well, look, you know, if real exchange rate changes its properties, it cannot be that prices are flexible, right? It cannot be that money is neutral because the only thing that happened was a change in monetary regime why would the real variable change its behavior so drastically, right? But then Baxter and Stockman, they say, well, let's look at other macro variables. And other macro variables actually did not change their behavior when there was this massive change in the behavior of exchange rate. And so here I plot, for example, a rolling, rolling uh, window, standard deviation, annualized standard deviation of different variables. And so you can see how standard deviation for nominal and real exchange rate, for nominal, it goes from zero to 12%. For real, it goes from something like 2% to 12%. And nominal and real exchange rates become essentially indistinguishable during the float. While if you do the same for inflation, consumption, output, you don't see a structural break. I mean, yeah, like if you use some, some sort of statistical tests, occasionally they find a structural break, but basically, you know, the red lines before and after tell you the average volatility in the pe pre first period and in the later period, right? And so kind of this is really uh, this, the sense of the Musa puzzle. And this 
provides us a lot of information for identification. Okay, and so going a little closer to finance, well, on the financial side, so we could look at Beckus Smith's correlation and we could look at the Fama regression coefficient. And what's interesting is both of those things, remember the benchmark is plus one for both of them. The data, as I told you, under the flow, that's close to zero, slightly negative. And so this is what you see, right? Like in the data, during the flow, these are the red bars. It's negative, sometimes a lot negative, sometimes mildly negative. Uh, during the peg, the puzzle is kind of less uh, strong, right? The coefficients that tend to be positive, sort of in the right direction, but again, they're not plus one. And so you want to kind of build a model where a lot of these puzzles um, are particularly strong in the floating period, right? So this is another kind of over-identification uh, set of moments for, for the theory. Okay, so from now on, I'm just gonna go into equations and try to give you a flavor of how these models work. It's, it's really one model with different applications. So the starting point is the PPP puzzle, because a lot of people try to get into thinking about exchange rates from the point of view of PPP puzzle, right? Because we can measure nominal exchange rate, we can uh, measure inflation and so calculate the real exchange rate, and it already offers a very interesting puzzle to solve. Why is nominal and real exchange rates are so closely uh, correlated? So what is the real exchange rate? Well, essentially you look at a, a consumer price level in one country, consumer price level in the other country, convert it to the same currency, and if they move, well, you say something like PPP holds at the aggregate in the dynamic sense, right? And the intuition sometimes is given like the low of one price, right? That the consumption basket in one place should be the same value as consumption basket in another place. Of course, when you live in the world of non-tradables, the consumption baskets are not the same. So it's PPP is a different concept from the low of one price, right? And so uh, a very important paper is Engel 99. So he said, well, let's do that decomposition. Let's split real exchange rate into tradable part and the non-tradable part and see what component drives it. So if it's about consumption baskets not being portable across space, right? If it's about non-tradables, then maybe the big deviations come from the non-tradable component, but the tradable real exchange rate is actually kind of pretty stable, mean reverting, not very volatile and so on. And so when he did that analysis, I'm not sure if, like, I was a student later, so I already took it as given. So I wonder back in 99, how surprised he was to find what he found. But essentially what he found was that 90 to 95% of variation in real exchange rate comes from the tradable component. So it's not about relative prices of non-tradables for which we had theory. Balasa Samuelson model was a theory of you know, relative non-tradable prices. But he actually found that it's all about the tradable component. And that kind of set the literature on this trajectory to try to find low fund price deviations. Because conceptually, like people thought that if it's a tradable component, it's got to be that prices of tradable goods are not equalized. So it's got to be that the low foreign price doesn't hold. So maybe it's sticky prices that explain it, or maybe it's variable markups that you said different, it's called price into market. You said different markups at home and abroad, and that's why the prices are not equalized for the same good. And this is where the literature went uh, for a long time. A lot of my early work was, you know, working with models of low foreign price deviations. But a very surprising finding, I, I'm not sure who to attribute it to. We discovered it was DEMA, but I guess it existed uh, in that case and burst in as a quantitative result. And perhaps a lot of people knew about it, but I don't know where it was actually written down. The, 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 the quite remarkable finding here that low fund price deviations do not really do anything for understanding uh, real exchange rate, purchasing power parity deviations, right? And so it's very easy to make that case when you work with variable markup models it turns out that if some people, some firms increase markups, other firms reduce markups. It's very intuitive, right? Like somebody gains competitiveness, somebody loses competitiveness. You cannot have that everybody, I mean, it could be that all markups go up, but when you have international shocks, exchange rate shocks or tariff shocks, it typically favors firms from one country and hurts firms from the other country. And so you have some markups going up, some markups going down in a given market. And the result in a large class of models, those effects wash out. And so even though low fund price deviations is a very robust feature of the data. It's right there. If you have micro data on prices, you can see all sorts of low fund price deviations there. It just turns out they wash out to a large extent. And so as a result, at the end of the day, you just get that equation which links uh, real exchange rate to uh, wage-based real exchange rate. One minus two gamma is the home bias. 
right? So home bias is important, and it's a home bias in tradables as well as in non-tradables, is that typically our consumption baskets are biased towards the domestic value added, whether through tradables or through non-tradables, and it doesn't really matter. But the point is that different things of, with, associated with low fund price deviations, they just drop out from this equation. You can crank up the amount of low fund price deviations and it will not affect that relationship, basically. And so basically what this suggests is that PPP approach to thinking about exchange rate kind of has a dead end. Even if you understand what happens to the uh, real exchange rate, it kind of doesn't give you an entry into thinking about general equilibrium properties of that variable. And so this is sort of like a starting point. This is a very partial equilibrium goods market approach. From here, you really need to get into a general equilibrium modeling of exchange rates, where it's a completely different set of equations that pins down the properties of exchange rates. And this would, this would end up being a side equation. It's useful as a side equation, but it doesn't pin down the general equilibrium properties of exchange rate. And so the way... I don't know if Dima agrees with me, probably he does. Uh, but the way I think at least about the PPP puzzle at this point uh, is that it's very simple. Something drives real exchange rate. You need a model of volatile real exchange rate. Well, real or nominal, it's a little tricky, you'll see now. But you are in a floating exchange rate regime where the central bank is good at stabilizing inflation. So it's not about price stickiness. It's not about variable markets. It's just a simple statement that central banks are pretty good outside of 2021, 2022 at stabilizing inflation. And if they're good at stabilizing inflation, whatever drives real exchange rate also drives nominal exchange rate, right? The link between them is monetary policy that stabilizes inflation. And this is a trivial theory, right? It doesn't tell you what drives the exchange rate. It just tells you that if central banks are good at stabilizing inflation, you're not going to get a gap between real exchange rate and nominal exchange rate. This would be one kind of by default piece of the theory, the fact that, you know, in floating regimes, rich country central banks know how to stabilize inflation, right? And, but it doesn't help us make further progress. We need something else. Uh, and so there is a paper by Eichenbaum, uh, Johansson and Ribello who makes a related point, right? That basically you can explain this co-movement between real and nominal exchange rates just if the central banks are good at stabilizing inflation. So PPP puzzle is kind of super easy if you adopt that view. Okay, I love this one. Um, is real exchange rate stationary, right? A huge question. I'm, I, I'm not sure why. I think finance economists too, but at least macroeconomists are very committed to this idea that real exchange rates are stationary or mean reverting in the long run at least, right? Where does that idea come from? Is there empirical evidence for that? Not really. Is there a good theoretical reason for that? No, there are two reasons. One, it helps us close the models without specifying the full model, you just say something is stationary and you throw out one equation, it turns out, right? Uh, uh, secondly, um, there is the sense that exchange rates are mostly driven by monetary shocks. Money is neutral in the long run, so it better be that real variables, I mean, revert in re like real exchange rate. And so maybe that's a second reason. But conceptually, how, how, how do I think about exchange rate? Well, it's not mean revert and there is no uh, necessary financial equilibrium condition that says it needs to be mean reverting. The condition is a transversality condition on net foreign assets of the country. You have an intertemporal budget constraint and it has to hold. So on one side, it's a uh, no Ponzi game condition from the financial market that's imposed on the country. On the other hand, it's a transversality condition of optimization of the country, right? It means that you cannot have exploding net foreign assets neither in positive nor in negative part and that pins down the long run value of real exchange rate. It doesn't have to be stationary. If you accumulated a lot of net foreign assets, your exchange rate will tend to appreciate in the long run, right? Of course, we can write down models where there are forces through the financial equilibrium condition which make real exchange rate stationary, but this is an additional piece of theory, right? Like a priori, there is no good reason to think of exchange rate as stationary, but you really need to impose transversality condition on net foreign assets, and that pins down where the exchange rate goes in the long run, but it means you really need a country budget constraint. And like, who wants to write down a finance model and put a whole country budget constraint into that model? That seems very onerous, right? So, but, but really what pins down the long run properties of the real exchange rate is, is, is the intertemporal budget constraint. Okay, oh, uh, so next I can get to uh, Beckus Smith. So this is kind of the fun stuff, uh, right? Okay, so how do people typically, well, starting from the Beck of Smith's paper back in 1993, how do people typically think about the relationship between consumption and uh, real exchange rate, right? So assume separable CRRA utility, which is like a 
you know, simple starting point. And then the stochastic discount factor is just consumption growth uh, times sigma, times the relative risk aversion, right? And then in complete market models, nominal exchange rate, changes in nominal exchange rate, it's just the M, M minus M star relative SDFs, right? And SDFs are linked to consumption. So consumption growth is linked to real exchange rate by the, uh, by the uh, efficient risk sharing between countries. And so over there in the corner over there, so I wrote from the point of view of the planner, what is the planner does? The planner says, I have a marginal dollar left. Who should I give the marginal dollar to? To the home household or to the foreign household? And so the home household will convert it into a home consumption basket using the price level at home. And that would give the home household marginal utility. The foreign household needs to first convert the dollar into foreign currency, then use foreign currency to buy foreign consumption basket, and then convert it into marginal utility. But the point is that the planner is trying to uh, equalize the cost of delivering marginal utility in the two countries. And of course, if you write a complete markets model, a Rodebrew model, it decentralizes what the planner is trying to do. So it's not surprising if consumption is expensive, you want to give less uh, consumption to the country where consumption is expensive. Why? Because, you know, one dollar will go a shorter way of delivering marginal utility, right? And so this is the idea that you give consumption more in a place where prices are lower, when, where, where exchange rate is uh, depreciated. So high consumption, depreciated exchange rate. And in macro, we measure depreciations going up, so it's like a positive correlation, right? So depreciation, high consumption. In the data, the correlation is negative, right? Of course, we don't believe in complete markets. Like, I mean, uh, who believe? Uh, maybe somebody does. But uh, so it seemed that maybe Beckwith-Smith's puzzle is like not such a difficult puzzle to solve. Just let's give up complete markets, right? And so when you give up complete markets, financial equilibrium condition starts to look something like this. So instead of holding state by state, the relationship is between expected consumption growth and expected devaluation. This is how you will be trading the bonds. But then you can figure out models which have the shocks here. So the shocks can reflect efficient risk premia, they can reflect financial frictions, uh, they can reflect intermediation frictions and segmented markets. And there is a, a lot of models that would put that wedge in the equation. And so, you, oh, you see the budget constraint was equation number one in the theory. Uh, this risk sharing condition in this form will be equation number two in the theory. And it turns out in a large class of models, that shock is also the UIP shock. It's something that you need to have a departure from, uh, you know, pharma, uh, pharma regression to go in the right way. And so in that sense, solving this puzzle is quite related to, to that puzzle as well. Um, okay, what did I want to say here? Okay, so, so what's the problem? Well, the problem is that people in macro try to write down models of incomplete markets and the Beckwith-Smith puzzle remained a very persistent puzzle for the literature. So you write down incomplete markets with productivity shocks. You write incomplete markets with no monetary shocks and sticky prices. And still, you, the model produces a correlation between consumption and real exchange rate, which is not plus one, but it's plus 0.97, right? You simulate those models, and it's like departing from plus one is very, very difficult. And it turns out it's not about market completeness. It's about something else. And so I guess where in a way where I think we made a big progress uh, in, in the papers uh, with Dima is trying to fi figure out where that puzzle is coming from. And it turns out in order to solve the Beck Smith puzzle, you need to go to the goods market. It's kind of ironic, but you have to forget about financial market for a second, even though Beck Smith's condition originated as a financial paper, right? But you have to go to the goods market. And in the goods market, you have a goods market clearing condition. Goods market clearing condition is present in, in every model that you write, like markets need to clear. If you have goods trade of some sort, goods market need to clear. And the point is the following. So this is already, um, you know, this is equation that you get from goods market clearing. And so what's the intuition here? So remember this term right here is about home bias. And we work with models where there is a lot of home bias, like in the data. So, you know, you divide by something, but that number is not very far from one, right? So you can ignore it. Uh, but what does that equation says? Well, that equation says that there are two types of shocks. There are shocks that expand output available for consumption in each country. This is Y minus Y star. And so if you expand the output available for consumption in a given country, that country will expand consumption. That's goods market clearing, right? But then there is expenditure switching here. The blue term is the expenditure switching. It's a movement in the real exchange rate. And basically you say that when the domestic goods are becoming cheaper 
everybody in the world starts switching to consumption of the domestic good. But the only way this can happen in equilibrium to clear the markets, if my relative consumption falls relative to the rest of the world relative consumption, otherwise you're not going to have enough of the domestic goods. I'm home biased towards my good. So it's only possible that everybody increases the consumption of domestic good when exchange rate depreciates, if my consumption falls relative to the foreign person's consumption, right? And this is why the coefficient is negative. It's just a requirement of goods market clearing that if domestic goods become cheaper in relative sense, domestic consumption should fall relative to foreign consumption unless there was an increase in output. So in models where there is no increase in output, just movements in exchange rate, you're going to get that negative correlation. Uh, let me, it's a little tricky, this logic a little tricky. Every time I explain it, it's even tricky for me. Uh, but the, the logic going the other way is much easier. Think of now a financial shock. That I have some time still, right? Uh, you, you, you have a financial shock that makes you want to delay your consumption. So uh, I'm Germany. I said, I don't know if it's a good example. Um, uh, let's speak another country. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm UK. There is turbulence in UK. I want to delay my consumption today. Uh, uh, what happens then? Well, the goods are produced. It's just I want to delay my consumption, but the goods are already produced. I need to allocate them to clear the market. How can I allocate the goods that are produced? Well, British goods need to become relatively cheaper. And then everybody in the world will switch towards British goods. That's the expenditure switching, right? So even though the British people chose to do more savings today and less consumption today because of, say, financial crisis or you know, some uncertainty increase or something like that, but the exchange rate will have to allocate the British produced goods everywhere in the world, and that requires a pound depreciation. Right? And so this is going from consumption to real exchange rate. But it really explains the same lo locus of equilibrium points in the goods market. When do does the goods market clear? And you get that negative correlation. So basically, if the shocks is something that comes from outside of the goods market and either moves your savings consumption decision or moves your real exchange rate decision, but doesn't move the output, you're going to get that Beckles Smith's negative correlation like in the data. The other cool thing is it's multiplied by gamma. Gamma is openness of the economy. So this is a weak force. Expenditure switching is a weak force because you're trying to move the whole aggregate consumption with just the international dimension of things, right? And Countries are not very open. So moving the whole aggregate consumption is very difficult, and it reflects in you know, gamma being the openness parameter, and this is quite small. And as a result, expenditure switching force always gives you the right sign of the correlation. It's negative, like Beckus Smith have found in the data, and it's a weak correlation because expenditure switching is a weak effect. So now, why macro models, why macro models could not deliver the right things? Well, because macro models are macro models because they move output. Right? So think about RBC model. RBC model is a productivity shock, moves output. So it's a shock to Y. Uh, the other type of model is a new Keynesian open economy model. It's a monetary expansion. And what does a monetary expansion do? Well, monetary expansion reduces markups, right? Like, like money goes up, prices or wages do not catch up with money, right? And you have a reduction in markups. Reduction in markups is like an increase in productivity. Right? It, it increases the amount of output in equilibrium. And so in that sense, both monetary and real models, they both operated through increasing the amount of output that's available for consumption. But when you have more output, you have more consumption, but the goods become cheaper. In one case, goods are cheaper because productivity shock happened. In other case, goods are cheaper because markup shock, markup went down. And so as a result, you again get this counterfactual Beckus-Smith correlation when consumption is high, when prices are low. So it's a positive correlation between consumption and real exchange. So it was not about the equations being wrong. Equations are the same. It's about the nature of shock. And so as a result, what this tells you is in order to get the Beckwith-Smith moment turns out to be the identifying moment. If you look at the Beckwith-Smith correlation in the data and you try to get minus 0.2, you need to mix exactly the right amount of conventional macro shocks, which gives you a correlation of plus one, with the right amount of financial shocks over there which will move exchange rate in equilibrium and give correlation according to the blue relationship, which is negative, right? And so because the blue relationship is weak, you need a lot more financial shock as drivers of exchange rate than macro shocks. And that explains why the financial shock has to account for like 80% of movement on exchange rate, driving a mild negative correlation. 
and the macro shocks drive 10, 15% of exchange rate, driving a very strong positive correlation. And then when you combine it together, you get that unconditional weak, mild negative correlation that Beko Smith found in the data. So graphically, the way it looks, uh, the blue curve uh, is um, the blue curve is the risk sharing curve. So basically, if I plotted this uh, and this, you will get the financial market equilibrium is an upward sloping line and the goods market equilibrium is a downward sloping line. And so what you want is that you shift, you, you do financial shocks, you shift around the financial market equilibrium curve, but you move along the market clearing condition in the goods market and that gives you the negative correlation, right? Instead of macro models that shifted around the goods market equilibrium condition and that you get the correlation along the financial market curve, which has the wrong sign, right? So, I mean, I don't know if this helps, but, uh, you know, this is the same equations that here uh, put on, eh, I'm sorry. Uh, so basically, if, if you can see it easier from equations, you know, this is this way. If it's easier from the uh, chart, it's this way. Okay, so this is what we think explains the Beckus smith moment uh, in the data. Okay, so now I'm, 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 I'm almost there. I got the unifying framework for thinking about exchange rates. So remember, we have the... Uh, equation number one was the budget constraint. So this is accumulation of net foreign assets and this is net exports. And there is expenditure switching inside net exports. So when exchange rate depreciates, you can expect an increase in net exports, at least eventually, right? Well, we're gonna write it statically, but empirically, at least eventually, there is a, indeed a relationship like this here with the lambda being positive. Uh, you know, this is just net exports written out. It takes a little work to get there, but this is without any cheating, you can get to this equation. Um, this is the financial market equilibrium condition, equation number two. Uh, and you can see that it turns out that in a large class of models, this risk sharing wedge, PC, is also the UIP wedge. And remember, we wanted that a lot of the shocks come from that wedge, right? And finally, goods market clearing that we just discussed, equation number three. If you put those three equations together, uh, you have a theory of exchange rate. Um, well, I guess, I hear a question saying like, but wait, Alec, there is a real exchange rate there and it's a kind of nominal exchange rate in the financial market here. So like, how do you go between nominal and real exchange rates? Because when we do carry trades, we think about nominal exchange rates, not real exchange. Well, remember there was equation number four, which was monetary policy. Monetary policy is pretty good at stabilizing inflation rates. So real and nominal exchange rates are tied together by monetary policies. That, that would be equation number four. But I omitted it and I'm thinking about one concept of exchange rate. Uh, in macro, we typically use this equation, so it's more convenient. I guess in finance, it's more convenient to think about risk sharing in, in, in context of a UAP equation. But it turns out, you know, it's the same, it's, it's the same risk sharing wedge between countries, oftentimes that, that, that in both conditions. Okay, and so the two propositions here, the first one is in order to get the right properties of exchange rates under the floating exchange rate regime, you need that this guy right here, accounts for 80%, roughly speaking, of exchange rate volatility in equilibrium. And we kind of walk through how you get different properties, weak correlations, very large, very large volatility of exchange rate, right? Because, you know, the spillover from exchange rate, going back to this equation, uh, I'm not seeing it very well, but they have one minus, okay, so what is one minus alpha? What is theta and what is gamma? Gamma, I told you, it was the openness of the economy. One minus alpha is passed through from exchange rates into border prices, into import prices. And remember how terms of trade was much more stable than exchange rate. That suggests that one minus alpha is a small elasticity passed through from exchange rates into border prices are not very high. And this is where you need low fund price deviations, right? So this helps. And theta is the pass through from prices to quantities. And so if the product of those blue terms is small, a lot of volatility in exchange rate, this 10, 12% of volatility every year, do not translate in a lot of macro volatility. You know, the, the transmission of exchange rate into macro is muted by that blue term being small. So this is why you can simultaneously match the disconnect in terms of correlations and in terms of uh, volatility. Okay, very good. But now, the, it turns out that once we reach this point, we realize that that, that, that really doesn't tell you what is the nature of this shock, of the psi hat. Um, you, you know, you have a variety of models. Sometimes you can have convenience yield models where you put uh, the bonds into the utility function. Uh, you can have uh, financial friction models like Gabex Majori, uh, 
uh, uh, and many other papers in this literature. You can you can have risk-based models like intermediation-based with segmented markets. This is the type of model that we adopted following the all the literature by uh, Schleifer and co-authors and Jean and Rose, and then uh, it recently became also more popular the mark the segmentation with the uh, you know portfolio choice of intermediaries. Um, uh, then you can have models of heterogeneous beliefs or infrequent portfolio adjustment. All this model, there is big literature on all of these topics, and they all produce a psi shock in the end. They all produce the shock. But without knowing what's the right model, you cannot go to the policy analysis because the shock is endogenous, right? You cannot really ask the question, is it optimal to peg or the float exchange rate without knowing the nature of this, this shock? And so the Musa puzzle gives you an entryway into thinking about it. It tells you that the only way, and it's a whole paper, and I will not be able to explain it very well, I think, in a couple of minutes. But basically what we prove in that paper is that the only way you can conceptually um, uh, reconcile those pictures about the Musa puzzle, that exchange rate changed its property, but consumption didn't change its property, is, is, is uh, if this guy, the UIP deviation, changes its properties between floating and fixed exchange rate regime. It becomes a lot more volatile under the float and exchange rate regime. So opening up the possibility of exchange rate moving around creates bigger UIP deviations. Well, that's not very surprising perhaps, like bigger, bigger possible carry trade returns and also bigger possible carry trade losses, right? And so you need to write down a model where this psi hat is endogenous to monetary regime. A lot, it excludes a lot of models, right? So if it's a model, um, a purely real model where monetary regime does nothing and it doesn't work through risk, then that model will, it will have a hard time generating a property of that UIP shock that changes between float and a peg, right? Which is just a change in monetary policy. At the same time, if you write down models based on risk and market segmentation, it gives it very naturally to you. So what does a move from peg to float do? It opens the door to exchange rate volatility. But exchange rate volatility is additional risk that intermediaries don't want to take. So they actually need to be more compensated for doing the same amount of intermediation. So it's either intermediation will go down or UIP deviations have to be bigger under the float. And so as a result, you kind of in the reduced form get bigger UIP shocks in the model with segmented markets and um, uh, risk-based intermediation, risk constraints to intermediation. And so this is a different way of generating monetary non-neutrality. Typically in macro, we get monetary non-neutrality through sticky prices. Here, prices are not sticky. They're, they could be sticky or flexible, it doesn't matter. Monetary non-neutrality comes through market segmentation because uh, the policy function of intermediaries is different under the peg and under the float because the amount of exchange rate risk that they take on, it's a fixed point right, in equilibrium, how much there is exchange rate risk, but it changes between a peg and a float, and as a result, it changes the policy function of intermediaries, and this is the source of, uh, uh, of non-neutrality, right? So why does a model without segmentation doesn't work? Well, in a model without segmentation, the problem is that exchange rate risk will not be priced very much. Exchange rate risk is orthogonal to macro, so if you try to price it with a household SDF, you're not gonna get much of a risk premium from it, it's just not enough. But if you think about models of segmented markets and intermediation, exchange rate risk is held in a very concentrated way by a small subset of specialized currency traders. And they value that risk, right? They value that risk a lot, a lot more than a typical household would, right? And so as a result, you get, you know, uh, you can get a big kick here, big enough that could be consistent with this very low volatility of real exchange rate under the peg and very high volatility under the float. I actually know how to explain the Musa puzzle paper. Um, so let me go back. Uh, Marcus, can you give me another 10, 10 minutes? Where's my picture? Okay, so, so this is interesting. So the question is, which part of this picture is most puzzling? Um, it's a question to the audience, so I hear the answer. It's the bottom left. So why is it the bottom left picture that's most puzzling? And it, it's amazing because the literature went in somewhat different direction. The literature, I, I, I was not there, but this is how I reconstruct how the literature went, was like, okay, exchange rate became volatile, but it should create this craziness in macro, right? How we as a central bankers will deal with all that exchange rate volatility? How will we stabilize inflation? if exchange rate is so volatile, wouldn't it disrupt you know, consumption and output and so on? And so people really were worried about volatility here. They're like, if volatility opens up here, why doesn't it uh, 
pass through into volatility of macro aggregates. And this turns out to be a very simple problem to solve. You just say, countries are fairly closed. So if you trade little, all that craziness in the exchange rate, well, it affects only a small part of the economy, the export and import sector, but you know, it's a small part of the economy. Then before exchange rate affects anything, it needs to affect prices and there is limited pass through into prices. And then, you know, it needs to affect quantities a lot and there is limited kind of elasticity of quantities. And so as a result, it's a very partial equilibrium story, how you go from a lot of volatility to not too much volatility here. So you solve it with that, remember that blue term being small is exactly why all this volatility doesn't translate here. So now the bigger question that was sort of omitted from the literature, and this is sort of what we try the whole Musa puzzle paper is really about that, is like, why there was not volatility here? And think about it, all this financial volatility, if we believe it's financial volatility, I tried to convince you that it is, right? That drives the exchange rate. Well, under the peg, the central bank must have offset the movements in exchange rate with its policy rule. So it must have changed the interest rate rule to absorb all of the shocks here, right? The shocks, they didn't disappear. If the shocks didn't disappear, Central bank is absorbing them, and it's absorbing them by changing its monetary policy. But if central bank is changing monetary policy, it needs to affect inflation or output gap or output eventually. Why don't we see any volatility that the central bank absorbs from here and pushes it into here, right? And so we don't. Why is that? Well, because UAP shocks sort of endogenously disappear. When you shift from float to the peg, UAP shock disappear because there is no risk anymore, and intermediation is much more frictionless now, right? The financial sector is willing to intermediate a lot more at lower UIP deviations. And the fixed point of that is less exchange rate volatility without the need to change monetary policy rule very much, right? And so one thing that we do in that paper, we also see how much volatility of interest rates changed. And then says volatility of interest rates did not change all that much, suggesting that it changed some, but suggesting that most of stabilization kind of happens endogenously, almost through credibility of the peg. You need to change monetary rule very, very slightly. Uh, so this is what I wanted to tell you about the positive side of the models. Then I have a couple of slides on the normative side. I feel that if I show you equations, you will maybe hate me. Uh, so uh, I, let, me, let me not show you equations and just show you pictures, right? At this point, probably pictures are better. Um, so basically, once you wrote down this model and once you made, once you made the psi shock endogenous uh, to the uh, uh, monetary policy regime, this gives you a very natural entryway into thinking about optimal monetary policy because you now, the central bank now appreciates the fact that if it changes from peg to float, it changes something in the financial market and when you design the policy, you have to take it into account, right? And so the way we're going to write down the model, I really, I don't want to spend time here. This is really the expenditure switching condition, the goods market clearing expenditure switching condition that we sort of discussed, but we kind of know a way to simplify it even further. Uh, it's kind of here, but let me say two words about the financial market equilibrium condition right here. So this is the UAP deviation, expected UAP deviation in the numerator. This is the expected carry trade return. This is the volatility of exchange rate. So this is the carry trade risk. So sigma is volatility of exchange rate, carry trade risk, and omega is the risk aversion of uh, the currency trader. So this is how this um, segmented market uh, risk-based models look like. And what's on the right-hand side? Well, this is the position that the intermediary would like to have if this is the UAP deviation, but markets need to clear. So whatever the intermediary takes on, he needs to be on the other side of trade of the households, of the noise traders, and of the central bank. Right, that's the market clearing in the financial market. So when there is demand for dollars, uh, there is a size of the UIP deviation at which intermediaries would provide those dollars. The more there is exchange rate risk, the bigger is the required UIP deviation to compel intermediaries to provide those dollars. But if the central bank chooses to provide dollars, it would be the F here. F would be the reserves of the central bank. Then intermediaries need to provide less dollars to the market. Right, and the equilibrium UIP deviation can be smaller. Right, and so this is the sense of this equilibrium condition in the financial market, which we can rewrite it in uh, you know risk sharing terms like that. And so basically, the size of the UIP deviation is the demand for currency that needs to be provided by intermediaries times the risk premium that that, that these intermediaries want to charge, which is omega risk aversion times sigma squared, which is 
the amount of risk that they take on, right? And so this is a very finance approach to thinking about you know, the nature of UAP shocks, right? UAP shocks reflect the size of the position times the uh, value of risk from the point of view of the intermediaries, right? And so now the central bank, the central bank has two instruments. It can do monetary, standard monetary policy, so it can change the interest rate and affect output gap in the domestic economy, or it can try to intervene in the, uh, in the, in the exchange effects market and provide dollars in response to shocks that require dollars. And so uh, he, here's an illustration of how this model works. Um, so let's start from the conventional models. So conventional models, uh, I, uh, we can call them trilemma models or mandel Fleming uh, models or new generations of mandel Fleming models going all the way to, say, Opsfeld Rogoff and the uh, literature that was building on Opsfeld and Rogoff. These models say, well, I'm going to plot it in the space of output gap here output gap and exchange rate volatility here. And so basically the government can always choose to peg or to partially peg, reduce exchange rate volatility. It always comes at the cost of creating the output gap, right? You can choose to do something with your monetary policy domestically, which will stabilize exchange rate. You will use your interest rate to offset exchange rate movements, but it's typically not gonna be the efficient interest rate anymore and you will create an output gap. And so as a result, you are on this curve, right? This is the set of choices that you have when you are in a trilemma style models and a mandel Fleming go opsfeld drogo or Dornbusch style models, right? And so then there is a very famous Friedman argument. Uh, we, we call it a Friedman float. He says, there is really no point in pegging the exchange rate. Pegging exchange rate is stupid. It only comes at the cost, right? Like we don't care about exchange rate per se. It's not part of our objective function. What we care about is that there is no output gap. And Float and exchange rate, you know, there is a particular notion of a float which guarantees that you don't get an output gap. You do optimal monetary policy from the point of view of inflation and output gap trade-off without thinking about exchange rate at all. And this would be the Friedman float right here, right? And there is really no point to de de deviate from it. This is the efficient outcome, and it's associated with some degree of exchange rate volatility, right? And that's the equilibrium exchange rate volatility that's good because we really don't care directly about the level or the volatility of exchange rate percent. And of course, the policymaker can do the peg and go here and basically absorb all of this exchange rate volatility and put it into macro variables and end up in a bad, in a bad point, in a bad choice where you have a lot of distortion in the goods market, but a fixed exchange rate. There is no use for, from the fixed exchange rate. Of course, well, it turned, I, I, I'm not sure of course or not, but this is a new result in our paper is that there is an open economy divine coincidence. We typically talk about closed economy divine coincidence when there is no trade-off between output gap and inflation. In an open economy, there is an additional layer of divine coincidence and it's a point, and the point is stated like that. If the first best real exchange rate that supports efficient expenditure between tradables and non-tradables or between home and foreign goods is stable, Right? Imagine that the, the first best real exchange rate does not need to move. You can get no output gap, no distortion with a fixed real exchange rate. Then there is no point in having float in nominal exchange rate. The only purpose for nominal exchange rate when it moves is to allow relative prices to change when prices are sticky. But if real, first best real exchange rate does need to move, it means that nominal exchange rate does not need to move to accommodate that adjustment in relative prices. And as a result, the peg and the float are the same. You, you, you get to this origin point, right? There is no trade-off between these two points. Whether you float or you peg, you're gonna get the same outcome. It's just like the divine coincidence and the closed economy. Whether you target output gap or you target inflation, you will get the same outcome on the divine coincidence. And so it's a very difficult thing to check. And it's also very implausible that the first best real exchange rate is stable. Why should the first best? I mean, there are examples of models where it can be the case as a knife edge case. But in general, we don't expect divine coincidence, the open economy version, to be really a relevant point of approximation maybe even. So we really think of most relevant as like this trade-off in the trilemma models. But we don't like trilemma models because they result in, they, they result in all these puzzles, right? These are the models that result in puzzles. So how does in the space lo looks a model that actually is consistent with the uh, empirical properties of exchange rate. Well, it turns out it looks like this, so check it out. So in, in the model of exchange rates with, uh, you know, segmented risk-based financial intermediation and a lot of, you know, noise trader shocks, it turns out if you do the peg, this point is still feasible. 
It's not the point that you want, but it's still feasible. Why? Well, because that model is a little extreme. It basically says that if there is no exchange rate risk, intermediaries will do all the intermediation efficiently. It, is, it's, it will be like a, a, a model with perfect supply of currencies, right? If you want dollars, you can get dollars. If you want Deutsche Mark, well, you can't anymore, but you can get euros. And uh, basically, as a result, this point is still feasible. So you completely kill off all financial volatility if you promise a peg. And it's enough to just promise a peg, and then financial market will do all that intermediation frictionlessly. It's a little unrealistic, but th that could be an interesting point of approximation. Then, of course, you can say, well, there is a little bit of intermediation friction even if exchange rate is not moving around. And then you're gonna get into a point which is somewhat to the right, right? But then what happens then? So this is a model of financial amplification. You depart a little bit from a fixed exchange rate and suddenly, endogenously, the exchange rate volatility keeps going up. It's not the trade-off as in the Mandel model and the mandel Fleming model or Opsel Drogov. It's, it's a trade-off that looks like this. The more you allow exchange rate to move, the less intermediaries want to intermediate without further compensation for risk, which in itself creates an additional shock to, um, to exchange rate, right? So shocks get amplified, right? So basically, you want dollars, you try to come to intermediaries to get dollars, and they say, well, you'll have to pay a bigger premium, which in itself is like a shock, right, in this model. And so as a result, it acts like an amplification device. And so when you go to a complete float where you close the output gap, well, it turns out you end up with this amount of exchange rate volatility. We'll do all that financial volatility that you let in, right? Because it's, it's a fixed point, right? Like if the in equilibrium there was less exchange rate volatility, right? Uh, then the UIP deviation would have been smaller, but you find a fixed point where it's consistent with the behavior of intermediaries and you kind of end up there, right? And so basically now the choice is not between this and this point. You still want to be where Friedman, where Friedman told us we want to be, we still want to get there, only keep fundamental exchange rate volatility. But it's not feasible anymore, right? You can be either here or you can be there, and that point is not exactly feasible. Well, it turns out if the government can take on the role of intermediary, if the government becomes an agent that provides dollars when people want dollars, right, in, in, in a country, and provides euros when uh, people want euros, it's possible to reduce the thread region. So doing open market operations allows you to reduce red region and get closer to the blue point, which is still the first best, right? That, that's still the optimal allocation. But in general, without having enough reserves to fully offset demand for currencies of everybody, this is really would have implemented something like a Friedman rule in the closed economy, an open economy version of it. Uh, it's still the case that the blue point is not feasible and you have to choose a point along this red curve and if you are a very open economy, well, maybe you want to shift. Uh, if you're a very open economy, which way do you want to shift? Let me think about it. If you're a very closed economy, uh, you don't care about exchange rate from the point of view of the goods market. And that point is good for a very closed economy. The more open you are, the more exchange rate volatility is useful from the point of view of the goods market. And you want to kind of shift in that direction. So regions that trade in the goods market less with each other, um, yeah, so, so so there is a, uh, well, I don't want to get into that. Uh, yeah, l let's, yeah. So let me let me stop here. So basically you, you want to choose a point here and like openness would be one of the parameters that makes you move along, along that curve. So now let me tell you what happens in models where financial shocks are exogenous. Imagine you have a model where financial shocks are present, but they're not endogenous to monetary policy regime. So then you're going to get this. You, this models will, will, will agree with our model in this point, they will be able to replicate all the moments in the floating regime. They will be consistent with exchange rate disconnect in the floating regime. But the problem is, is that the central bank, when it will try to peg, the, this endogenous financial amplification will not quite work. What will happen is that the central bank will need to absorb, using the monetary policy rule, all of that crazy financial volatility. And so that point is the Musa puzzle kind of point. It's the point where under the peg, you get a lot of macro volatility, which we didn't see in the data, right? And so this is kind of closes the loop between, uh, you know, the policy analysis and the first Musa puzzle picture uh, that I showed you. I think I'm pretty much done. Ah, yeah. So I have a, a bunch of policy implications here. So we talked, uh, we talked about a few of them already, and I will wrap up in a, in a moment. So what this model really predicts is that there is a very strong incentive for a lot of countries to do partial pegs. Right, you can do, you can offset some of the exchange rate volatility using open market operations. And a lot of countries do that. 
there is a question why Europe doesn't do uh, open market operations to stabilize the euro against the uh, dollar. And the argument there could be that the market is so deep that financial inter there are lots of financial intermediaries there, but also lots of noise traders. And you would need a crazy size of the balance sheet of the central bank to do it. So it becomes basically easier to let the exchange rate float given fairly efficient amount of financial intermediation. But at the same time, if we look outside the deve developed countries, uh, pretty much most of the developing countries choose to peg or crawl and peg or dirty peg or uh, or dirty float or something like that. So like most non uh, non developed countries actually do some form of a pegs exchange regime, and it actually really does look like choosing a point on this red curve somewhere there, right? You don't go to the full float, but you also don't go to the full peg. Of course, there are a bunch of countries that do a full peg, right? And so the answer here is the divine coincidence. If you're closer to divine coincidence, where you don't want your real exchange rate with your trade partners to move very much in, in, in the first best, then there is not much of a cost to a peg and there is a financial benefit uh, to a peg. Okay, so I will stop here. Uh, I don't want to talk about that. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, so let me pick maybe one more policy to talk about. So it turns out, oh, let me talk about Trilemma for a second. So the model that I showed you does not have a Trilemma constraint. Why is that? Well. Whenever you have an additional friction, it gives you an additional instrument, right? So sticky prices gives you interest rate as a tool to deal with output gap, right? Without sticky prices, interest rate will not be affecting real variables, right? So sticky prices is something that gives the policymaker an access to a new tool, the interest rate. Same thing here, financial friction gives the government access to a new tool, which is effects interventions. Effects interventions in a conventional model do nothing, right? You basically have a Modigliani Miller result between households and the government. Whatever the, uh, whatever the government does with its portfolio is can be undone by the households. It's a very Modigliani Miller style result. But with the segmented markets, Modigliani Miller doesn't hold. As a result, the government has access to a new policy tool, which is the effects intervention. And this allows to relax the trilemma constraint on policy. So you can, you don't have to compromise the domestic output gap and inflation stabilization if you want to partially peg the exchange rate using the FX intervention tool. But FX interventions cannot fully resolve the problem. You cannot replicate any passive exchange. Exchange rate has to be, passive exchange rate has to be consistent with the budget constraint of a country. And so the only thing that you can do with this FX interventions, you can kind of smooth out the passive exchange rates. You cannot permanently adopt a different level of exchange rate. That policy will result in, uh, you know, budget constraint being violated eventually. But what you can do is you can smooth the passive exchange rates with FX interventions. And this eliminates part of the financial volatility from exchange exchange rate, and this is really what the central bank wants to do. It wants to keep fundamental volatility in the exchange rate and get rid of, to the extent possible of the, you know, this noise, non-fundamental volatility in the exchange rate, which will improve risk sharing, right, if there is less, less noise volatility. So this is one thing I was going to say. Um, uh, yeah, there is this very interesting result is, okay, so you are UK. You see, so, so how do we interpret uh, the UK back, when, when, when was it? September, when there was a big shock to the, the pound. So how do we interpret it? Well, there is some uncertainty that's created, right? Uncertainty about the future. People want to get, get rid of pounds and buy foreign currency. It's a capital outflow shock. But the financial sector also see more uncertainty going forward. So it's the, it's the policy function of the financial sector changes as well. So people are trying to exchange pounds for foreign currency, move, move assets from UK to other countries. They come to intermediaries, but intermediaries also pull out at the same time because there is more uncertainty about the future. This is why pound depreciates so much. UIP deviations open up. Why is that? Well, the pound needs to depreciate to a point where the expected UAP, expected carry trade gains for the intermediaries compensate the increased risk, right? Can the policy maker stop it? Can the policy maker raise the interest rate to stop the capital outflow? Well, our theory actually says that no. You will be, you can effectively change the value of exchange rate, but over, all of it will go into output gap. Uh, what happens from the point of view of the carry traders, right? Uh, they really think about expected return and they think about the amount of risk. And doing a policy shift today does not, to a first order approximation basically, does not change either the expected return or the amount of risk. It's a little, I, I need to have better words to explain it, it's a result. I think it's true, but I'm not giving you a great intuition right now. But the point is what the policymaker can do is really reduce amount of uncertainty tomorrow. 
not raise the interest rates today and tighten the output gap. That will help you with exchange rate. You would look at exchange rate, you see like, look, I stopped depreciation, but it really will not help you with the capital outflow. And the problem is the capital outflow. And how do you deal with the capital outflow? Well, you deal by stabilizing the future, by either promising to have a partial peg in the future, not create a lot of exchange rate volatility in the future, or by reducing uncertainty about policies, right? And in that sense, you don't want to raise the interest rate today, but you want to create conditions that kind of uh, make intermediation less costly, right? Less risky, right? And this is one way of doing the policy. The other way is just step in and provide those dollars, right, to the market if they want it and eliminate the volatility in that way. So it's either the FX tool or some tool about future stabilization of exchange rate using uh, in principle, monetary policy as well. So let me stop here. There are uh, a bunch of different things to discuss, but let me go to my conclusion here. So basically what we tried to do is, you know, build a framework that's realistic in the sense that it's qualitatively and quantitatively consistent with properties of exchange rates. And at the same time, we want it to be tractable enough so we can talk about policies. And as you saw, most of it was actually analytical. We didn't need to go to a quantitative model here very much. But then we also wanted to be practical in the sense that we can revisit a lot of these policy prescriptions that were, you know, kind of robust in the previous literature. But now, um, you know, if you have this new financial shocks-based model of exchange rate, which is endogenous to monetary policy regimes, some of the answers actually change, right? And it, it makes it clear, uh, you know, what are the trade-offs of a peg, a little more than before and sort of what are the costs and benefits of a currency union, for example, as well. And going forward, and this is my last bullet point here. So going forward, I think it just opens up the door to a lot of research. Part of it is in macro, a large part of it is in finance. So in particular, we spend a lot of time in the goods market measuring markups, right? Markups has become a popular topic, but it arguably we spend not enough time measuring UIP deviations and different components of UIP deviations. Because in order to really do the policy, you need to know uh, not the value of exchange rates and interest rates. You really need to be able to have a good proxy for UIP deviations. CIP deviations are easy to measure, roughly speaking, but UIP deviations are hard to measure. And you want to know different components of UIP deviation. What part of it is markup? What part of it is a financial friction? What part of it is, uh, uh, you know, segmented markets and risk-based premium, right? And so can it, there is already a lot of work, but doing even more will really help the policymakers to know how to do the optimal effects interventions, right? So far, we didn't get in this area, as far as, you know, in the goods market, in measuring, you know, natural rate of interest, natural rate of unemployment, output gap, this have become a very conventional object. But if you want to do effects intervention policies, you really need to do the same dissection to UAP, right? And this is an input into the policy problem of the, uh, of the central bank. Uh, um, yeah, so this is what I want. Ah, yeah, yeah. So, so there is a huge literature now measuring elasticities in the financial market, right? You know, the supply of different assets, when the elasticity is high and low, what makes that elasticity change? Um, the big question is, what is the nature of that financial shock? Where do these noise traders come from? We have no idea. I mean, I, I know that in finance, people probably tried very hard already in the past to figure out where those noise trader shocks come from. But this is, you know, for thinking about optimal policy, knowing where the noise trader shocks is coming from could be crucial. Could it be that, fundamental macroeconomic shocks generate financial shocks. What's the relationship between them and so on? And finally, obviously, whatever is done for the open economy and exchange rates can be transplanted to closed economy and the stock market, right? If, if you want to stabilize the exchange rate, is there a case to stabilize in the stock market in a, in, a, in a similar way? Or maybe stock market is different. And so there is interesting work in that area as well. And so let me stop here. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Oleg. So let me just say a few words uh, and you have time to go to the mic. So there's Q&A. So the, if you want to ask a question, please go to the mic. So thanks a lot for having this uh, great lecture where you start out uh, with the empirical puzzles and then provide an analytical framework, how to think about it, and came to a conclusion that actually what matters is really finance. Uh, for exchange rates, it's all about finance primarily, and it's about segmented finance, you know, financial frictions. And of course, we, we are very pleased to hear that. And it's in a sense, it's a, it's a gift to us in the American Finance Association from Oleg, but I just was told by Philip Lane that actually we should give Oleg a gift today because today is his 40th birthday, is this correct? So let's give him a applause for his uh, birthday as well. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so let's uh, move on to the questions. So the microphones are here. Oleg, you have to come back. Um, Oleg, I think I have a question for you to which I think I should know the answer, but I'll ask it anyway. If I take you over to the United Kingdom before the September shock, interest rates there were lower than they are than they were here. And so interest rate parity, CIP, covered interest rate parity, seemed to be holding at the time with the FX rate there indicating a strengthening of the sterling. This was at the same time that inflation futures in the UK were higher than here, which would indicate that we would look for weakness in the sterling. So is this a puzzle or is this simply the difference between CIP and UIP? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't have a great answer. I think it's a, one of those questions that should be out there on the list, the relationship between UIP and CIP. Uh, we, we, we have models, which are models of um, frictional intermediation that will give rise to CAP and UAP simultaneously, kind of in the same direction. It's like the balance sheet cost models. Uh, we have models about risk, which are really about UAP and not so much about CAP. Uh, in practice, I think it's an open question to what extent UAP and CAP can move. Um, uh, is it, are they of the same nature? We know that they don't come move perfectly. We know that you know, the reason why I focused on UIP much more than on CAP is that UIP is a deviation, is a persistent feature of the data, both uh, during pegs, during floats, before 2008, after 2009. And there, before 2008, there were two orders of magnitude bigger than CAP deviations. Now they're about one order of magnitude bigger. So in terms of just, you know, magnitudes, if we uh, measure them, they're about 200 basis points versus 20, 30. 40 basis points. And so if, if we wanted to build a model of just one object, we decided to go with UAP, right? In fact, then it turns out this is for Musa puzzle. This was essential because risk played a role, right? But really making progress here, you want to write down a model which can, allows you to jointly think about UAP and CAP and to isolate a common component of the two, which comes from the balance sheet cost, financial frictions, and so on. Uh, and the component that's maybe peculiar to only CAP or to only UAP. And so you know, this is like a research agenda going forward. I really honestly don't have much to say uh, uh, about this. Yeah. Uh, I just have a question on your uh, data. Um, I'm wondering where you get your foreign exchange rate data before the peg and after the peg. Because it's, it's, is it something that was available in the market or it's, it's not like there's a central bank who, um, who announced a, a, an interest rate, the exchange rate before the peg, during the peg and after the peg. And so you mean, I mean where did you get that information? The question is about 1973, about the okay. end of it's Bretton Woods. Or after the peg, yeah. during well, the peg or after the peg, where did you get the information on the foreign exchange rate? Well, macroeconomic data exists, so we just use you know output, consumption, inflation, exchange rates. All of that data goes back to like 50s, 60s, fairly easily, and so right. seven. So published by the. Federal, by the government. Some of this so data is, for example, agency. yeah, for example, OECD data, right? Uh, would go for, you know, major developed countries. It will go back to like 60s, basically. But in our Musa puzzle paper, we have a data appendix where we specify which data sources we use. It, it's true, it's a bit of a problem going that back. And in order to study the pre -Bret the Bretton Woods period, you really need data from before 73. It becomes trickier. And so a lot of the questions that have to do with the micro level data, if you want to know the balance sheets of individual financial institutions, that data is not available. So to, a lot of theories, the way that you want to test theories and look at the balance sheet objects of different intermediaries, right? And to do that, you really need a modern period. Uh, and you need to figure out episodes of the pegs. Like Switzerland gives a very interesting episode of a brief peg uh, back in 2014, 15. And so we use a little bit that data if we want to look at, you know, the micro data. But macro aggregates are available going back to 60s. Oh, right. I think I'm trying to get to the, your point that the volatility in the foreign exchange market uh, of, uh, yeah, is purely financial um, phenomenon. Because even before the peg or after the peg, it makes no difference what the foreign exchange rate, that really, that kind of transaction uh, takes place uh, between the, the good markets, the producers of goods 
and services. And in, in the, the, I think I think that's what you're trying to say. Yeah. In your paper, there's some misallocation in the goods market, and and that is translated into the foreign exchange rate market, and um, and that you are arguing that if the central bank were to intermediate uh, to to provide the uh, the uh, the intermediary function in the exchange rate market the same way that they do mm -hmm. in the loans market, then it will smooth the volatility yeah, yeah. exchange rate market. But what my point is that they that um, it's a purely financial uh, phenomenon. I, I guess that's where I'm, I'm asking where the data comes from because yeah. the data is, is uh, in the foreign exchange rate, it's like a, a, an announcement. So I'm not sure if I interpret your question correctly, but let me try. This is uh, so. So the way we discipline our analysis was largely coming from simple, unconditional macro moments during different subsamples sub during the peg and during the float. So we only look at macro movement to discipline it largely. So now, if you really wanted yeah. to get at the heart of the theory, you really want to go to micro data on the positions of intermediaries and see whether that. So, so for example, size of UIP deviations we can measure using ma macro data or average returns on carry trades and so on. But if you really want to ask the question, did intermediaries change their yeah, policy it's function? In the loans market, there's regulation that the rate, the rate of yeah, borrowing so is it's heavily regulated, but I don't think it's the same in the foreign exchange rate market, and that's where you see a lot of Yeah, so so looking at that data specifically, we didn't do, but this, like, looking at the micro level where the behavior is changing, I think this is really the direct test of the theory. It's it's much harder to do than, you know, the type of empirical because analysis. I, I travel myself, and I never, you know, whatever exchange rate people say it is, we ne I never get it because they they give, they will sell and buy, Currency, however, how, whatever amount of money they want, uh, it, it's 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 not it's not fixed. I mean, it, it is kind of fixed, but it's not. Yeah. So, uh, thank you very much uh, for your very interesting presentation. Uh, I was not familiar with your work, but I I, I looked a, a little bit into the exchange rates recently, and I wanted to ask you this question. If I understood well your charts about the Mossa puzzle, um, so you don't find any relationship between increased volatility of the exchange rate and uh, uh, increased volatility, there is no increase in volatility of consumption. Uh, my question is, but have you tested or do you think it would be interesting to test uh, whether there is a relationship between the increase in volatility of the exchange rate and the trend in real variables such as consumption. Because if you think of it uh, historically, uh, for many countries, the, 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 the shift from fixed to floating exchange rate coincided with the change in the trend growth rate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that is uh, my question, basically. Yeah. Thank so B Baxter Stockman, uh, so their original paper in 1989 really looked at the changes in trend, shifts in trend growth rates between before 73 and after 73. We focused on second moments because macro models, like we wanted the business cycle frequency co-movement. And that's really not so much about the trends, but more about the co-movement. And our point is not that there was absolutely no change in 73. Our point was it's an order of magnitude difference. You look at exchange rate and there was truly an order of magnitude increase in volatility. While you look at any macro variable, at most the behavior there changes by 5%. So it's a change you know, 10 times to 1,000% versus a change of 5, 10, 15%. And so this is really, you, you don't really need a very precise statistical tools because of that, because there is such a gap, right? And so identification comes from that. And that's why we chose to focus on, you know, second moments because it just gives you a very clear identification. It, we're not trying to suggest that there was no other change before 73 and after 73. Plenty of things changed. It's just this stark discontinuity and order of magnitude that gives us identification. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Oleg. Thanks very much for your presentation. It's really interesting. And, uh, 
I'm also relatively new to the literature, so it was very insightful for me to kind of see how all of these different puzzles link together and uh, your kind of approach to trying to solve them. One of my takeaways, I think, from your presentation was that financial frictions probably play quite an important role in being able to help explain the, like a number of these puzzles simultaneously. And I was wondering how much you've looked at kind of seeing how well your model kind of explains the data when looking at sort of normal times versus crisis episodes. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I was thinking also about those macro charts that you were showing with the sort of exchange rate correlations. And um, do you find that actually these relationships co-move a lot more, let's say, in episodes of stress, periods of high uncertainty? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I think I understood your question uh, correctly, but uh, let, let, this is my answer here. So people oftentimes think about peculiar events like 2008, 2009 crisis, and there, like there is no disconnect there, right? There was an economic crisis associated with a steep appreciation of the dollar against many, many currencies, right? So it seems like a very much connected event. When we talk about disconnect, we really think about unconditional moments over broad periods of time. And so it turns out that outside those unique episodes where it's a very clear crisis, right? And we know the nature of the crisis, typically conditional on those events, there is no disconnect, right? But most of the time, there is no crisis. Most of the time, exchange rate still moves like a very volatile variable. And most of the time, um, there is no co-movement, right? And this is why there is a disconnect, right? So like you can find a lot of episodes when exchange rate moves by three, four, five percent without anything happening in the macro economy easily. And this accumulates over the year to like this big volatility of the exchange rate. And so in that sense, of course, periods of sharp crisis, they're driven by a common macro force. So all stock, all asset prices, exchange rate, a lot of macro variables move together but conditional on some big macro event happening, right? Same thing happens when the central bank raises interest rates in a major way, then it affects all asset prices, yield curve, it affects the exchange rate, it affects the macro aggregate. It just turns out if you do variance decomposition, those episodes do not account for the bulk of the volatility. And as a result, unconditionally, uh, you get uh, you get low correlations, right? But of course, thinking about what is the shock and transmission mechanism conditional on those episodes is very important as well. We're not making much you know much progress here, but you know models with financial frictions would matter there as well for sure. So, in just one very quick follow up, if I may, would you then caution against trying to use your modeling framework to sort of try and explain sort of specific episodes that are happening, you know, in kind of like like say the Brexit event, for example that's been talked about or the most recent uncertainty in the UK? Yeah, so I think or this is think very been? interesting and I'm sure that it will fit some of the episodes and maybe not fit others and then you need to think about additional ingredients. What was surprising to us that we really didn't need to change the basic transmission mechanism for thinking about the bulk of the variation as long as you acknowledge the role of this financial uh, financial shocks. But like, for example, a couple of examples I gave you, the Brexit is very interesting to think through our policy framework. I think we have something to say there and it kind of fits pretty well. Not the, sorry, not Brexit, the, the shock, uh, the pound shock in September. Also the effect of sanctions on the ruble and Russian economy was another example that we did where, you know, you, you use a very particular episode of a set of shocks and the same model, and it actually gives you something intelligible about what has happened. And it can allow you to explain why there was a steep depreciation of the ruble at first, followed by a steep appreciation, and then like it can predict what we expect to happen with the ruble going forward, for example, right? So these are examples, but yeah, no, I'm sure it's possible to find examples where it works well, and we'll focus on those. And it's possible to find examples when it works poorly. Uh, we, we have a few ideas, uh, and then somebody needs to write a better model. Yeah. Thanks very much. Let me abuse my position as uh, chair of the session and also ask Oleg a question. So, is it correct that you said, you know, it's mostly driven by financial friction? So, the emphasis whether we have a price thickness in consumer prices, con producer prices, or you know, in dollar prices is not really the driving, so it's not so important, or is this more important for other questions, uh, not for the exchange rate volatility? And then I have a, another question, you know, what we had in the 1980s, we had this huge, long-lasting dollar appreciation. Uh, is your framework able to say something about that too, or is this 
uh, something which is, you know, related more to bubbles and uh, dollar bubble, essentially, everybody talked about that time. So I don't know if everybody noticed, but the first one was a very charged question. Um, yeah. Well, it turns out that we wanted to be provocative in this research and we wanted to kind of say, you know, all these years of thinking about sticky prices, which way prices are sticky. To a first order, it's not that important for these big questions of PPP and so on. And so it's a first order approximation. It turns out uh, both me and Dima, we have separate research agenda on thinking about sticky prices and how sticky prices and different currencies affect things. So it kind of maybe being very provocative here sort of might seem to devalue that agenda. But you know, it turns out that the way price stickiness and the way prices are sticky is very important for a lot of other questions. It's just what we're saying here to first order approximation, if you want to write a disconnect model, what happens at the border is not as important if countries are sufficiently close to trade. You can just ignore that. Of course, as countries become more open to trade, the way prices are sticky and in which currency the prices are sticky at the border becomes more and more important. So if you're trying to understand, you know, UK or New Zealand, which are much more open countries, uh, than US, the Euro area, or Japan, then these details are really useful. And without sticky prices, you're going to have a hard time matching some of the moments. So sticky prices do help. And the recent developments you know, in thinking that prices are sticky actually in dollars or in euros, but not in producer or consumer currency, become very important then. And so for a lot of smaller countries, which is the majority out there, right? you cannot really ignore it. But if you really wanted to write a kind of first approximation theory of US versus Euro, Eurozone as a whole, then what happens at the border is just not of, you know, of, of that huge of importance. And if, even if prices were flexible, you'd be able to match most of the moments, right? Because, you know, both of these regions are fairly closed, right? Um, the second question, I have not thought about, it's very interesting to think about, you know, the 80s, uh, um, the depreciation that happened and like the Plaza Accord, what role the Plaza Accord played. We have not thought about it as much. Um, yeah, no, it's an interesting question. So one question that we had, I don't have an answer, is like, imagine there is a financially driven appreciation. So say you're Switzerland and there is a huge demand for Swiss safe assets, which causes this huge appreciation. How much does it affect your macroeconomy, your, you know, your output, employment, gross prospects, and so on, right? Is there a connect? And so what we emphasize is that at high frequency, there could be a lot of disconnect, high frequency up to five years, right? But also there is research that suggests that at, at longer horizon, five years and onwards, there is a very strong relationship between exchange rates and trade balances, for example, right? At least for the United States. And so it always happened that a dollar appreciation or depreciation five years later followed, uh, uh, with a big adjustment in, uh, in the trade balance. So th the question is, is it also true for Switzerland, for example? The fact uh, you know, that there was this big appreciation, did it cause a persistent trade deficit that will last for many years, right? Is Switzerland becoming more like US in terms of net foreign asset position and so on? So we don't have answers here. I think these are fascinating questions. Yeah, we just didn't have time to think about it. Yeah. I have one more. <laughs> so finally, uh, another provocative question. Would you argue that the financial sector in the FX market is too small. We should actually, from a social welfare perspective, we should actually you know, subsidize uh, arbitrageurs in the FX market in order to get the exchange rate volatility down. Is, did, did you do any welfare analysis on this? Yes, no, I, I see where Marcus is coming from with this one. Uh, do you need to recapitalize sort of not just banks, but intermediaries as well. This is the topic. So Pierre Olivier in the IMF, right? They're thinking hard about this. Uh, it would require an extension to the model. And I guess you can write the model in different ways. But the idea is if the central bank doesn't want to have a lot of reserves and do a lot of effects interventions, cannot make sure that financial sector is capitalized well enough so that intermediation is more smooth, right? And so Kind of the idea there is you want to leave some UIP deviations open, some carry trade profits there. So th that would be a source of profits for the financial sector. Out of these profits, the financial sector will build net worth. And so it will be more efficient than intermediation. And so if you completely eliminate all UIP deviations and carry trade return, then you will eliminate the financial sector that's doing intermediation. And that's probably not good. And so the question is, is there like a internal uh, optimality condition that you want to leave some of this markup 
basically, do you want markup of zero in that sector or do you want a positive markup that results in profits? And so, I mean, they're, they're thinking very actively about this, but you would need like some extra, um, so, some extra ingredients in the model, yeah, which we didn't have. Okay, thanks a lot uh, again, Oleg, for a fantastic lecture. And then thank you also for all the questions from the floor and also for participating and uh, being part of it. I hope to see you in the afternoon and tomorrow. Bye-bye.